the main takeaway of our uh, the main takeaway of our story here is that patients with multiple myeloma uh, they mount a variable and suboptimal antibody response, or I should say IgG response, after receiving uh, two doses of an mRNA COVID nineteen vaccine. Um, and that was especially important because we found that more than 15% of our patients developed no detectable antibodies at all, despite having received the two doses more than uh, 10 days uh, prior to, to our measurements. In terms of effectiveness, I think it was somewhat surprising that we saw that there's uh, a significant number of patients who didn't develop any antibodies at all. Um, we obviously asked the question why that was happening. Uh, it could be due to the disease itself, uh, as we know that cancer and blood cancer in particular, uh, these patients are more vulnerable to infections and they have a certain degree of, of immune dysfunction going on, um, even at baseline. And then on top of that, we add a lot of the treatments that we're using uh, in myeloma, but that, that also goes for other uh, hematological malignancies and even solid, uh, solid tumors that we add chemotherapy and immunotherapy that obviously impacts their immune responses. That being said, for many other diseases, I mean, this was a unique situation. We had access to uh, tests to measure an IgG response to a pathogen that we knew a lot of patients had never been exposed before. And that is different from flu or from other viruses that we know are also um, more common in, in our patients. Uh, and so this gave us a, a unique opportunity to study that. One other question, arguably, is whether or not it's important to see that patients have lower antibody levels or even undetectable antibody levels. Uh, and that is because our immune system obviously doesn't rely only on uh, serological immunity or antibodies, but also has a cellular component. And I mean, we were able to show that not only the, the serological component, but also the T cell immunity seems to be weaker or absent in, in a lot of the patients that were unable to mount antibodies. Our patients so far have been uh, receiving the traditional regimen of, of, of two doses. That is up until very recently when there was the guidance from, from the government here uh, to give a third shot to, uh, to patients with a, a severe immune suppression, including patients with myeloma that are on treatment. And so we've started implementing that. I think it's very early uh, to interpret these results. We've, ha we've seen some anecdotal results from mostly from transplant patients and some uh, broader cancer studies, but not in myeloma specifically. Uh, we have anecdotal data on our patients that have been receiving their third shot, uh, that some of them at least are able to mount antibodies or develop IgG after, after this, this third shot. There's, there's other ways or there's other guidances that I think we should consider giving to patients. One of them uh, obviously, I think when we see that patients have undetectable antibodies is that we should counsel them appropriately and ask them to perhaps extend their, their non-pharmacological interventions, their physical distancing, things like that. I think I appreciate a lot of the efforts that our patients have been doing already throughout the pandemic. These patients have been extra cautious. They've been very careful in, in what they do and what they don't do. And I think it's up to us uh, to give them proper guidance uh, in that regard. A third option or a third pathway that is worth exploring, and I'm, I'm not sure if there's any study data, or I'm not aware of it, uh, but it could be beneficial to treat patients with a passive immunization using either monoclonal antibodies or IVIG um, to protect them and, and cover their serological immunity, especially when they're in periods of, of increased vulnerability when they're receiving uh, very uh, when they're being transplanted or when they're receiving uh, these, uh, these different chemotherapy regimens. We wanted to study which patients uh, especially or what were the characteristics of patients at risk for not developing these antibodies or having exceptionally low antibody titers. And there we saw in a multivariate uh, statistical analysis on, on a couple hundred patients at our, uh, at our clinic, we found that being on active treatment was a risk factor uh, not having a complete remission was, a, was an important risk factor. And obviously having received more lines of therapy was a risk factor. But when we stratified by the type of therapy, we found that especially patients on a CD38 monoclonal antibody and patients that were receiving BCMA targeted therapy, that these were the groups that were specifically at highest risk of not developing antibodies. Uh, 
in itself that was uh, not entirely unexpected as we, as we know that these treatments impact the B cells uh, as well as plasma cells and that therefore they might impact uh, the ability of the body to generate a serological immune response. But it was very striking and, and highly significant that it, it's those treatment classes that are at the highest risk. We continue uh, right now to collect uh, samples for, uh, from our patients who are willing to cooperate on the, the MARS study that we've set up to, to follow the immune response after uh, COVID vaccination in order to study how the longitudinal dynamics uh, of the immune response uh, change. Because I think it's an outstanding question, an important question, whether or not the serological immunity might wane more quickly in patients that are receiving active uh, B cell uh, B cell impacting treatment versus healthy controls, and so we hope to to be able to show that data soon. Mm -hmm.